welcome to Exponential Church Services Online. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us today. Um, I've had a great week just reflecting on what we talked about last week on the services. And I know that I, I've reflected more on my, like how to keep my joy during this time, where my joy truly comes from. And I know that it really comes from, from God and it, it, it's all within. And so I've taken some time this week just to, to look at um, what God's doing in my life during this time. What about you? Well, I'm glad that somebody's getting something out of the message, and so that's a good thing. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things, you know, when we start thinking about where does my happiness come from, um, it's really kind of challenging to us, you know, because when we start letting our emotions go up and down, we start thinking, okay, am I basing my happiness on what's going on outside around me, or am I going to base my happiness on what's happening inside of me because of, of Christ? And so, uh, definitely a challenging message. And uh, we had some challenges even last week with the broadcast. And uh, um, I just apologize to anybody that had trouble um, watching the message last week. We got it back up just as soon as we could. And uh, hopefully people were able to uh, to see the message and, and take part in that. And so, I'm excited, Amanda, to kick off week number two of this series called Hashtag my daughter laughs at me when I do this, hashtag blessed, uh, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, what it is to, to mourn. Uh, again, one of those shocking statements that Jesus would make that in order to be happy, we got to mourn. That just doesn't make sense at all, and so uh, I'm excited about it. I'm um, excited about us getting in, into this series, and uh, we've got a special treat for you today. Uh, we were able to um, get the, the Expo Band. Uh, involved this week and so they were able to record a song for us and so um, you're going to hear from them and, and we want to invite you to worship right. with the band as they sing uh, a song called Broken Vessels uh, this morning and, uh, and then when it comes time for the message we just want you to sit back, relax and enjoy this message.
Well, last week we kicked off this series called Hashtag Blessed by learning this idea that true happiness is a heavenly happiness. In Matthew chapter number 5, Jesus, he preached this Sermon on the Mount that we've called it. And, um, and when he started this series, he started it by listing eight characteristic traits of, of true happiness, of, of what it is to be truly happy. Um, we, we have deemed these the Beatitudes. It comes from the Greek word beatus, which uh, means a state of supreme happiness. And so uh, we did this last week. I'd like to do it again with you and possibly every week through this series. I want us to read together. And by together, I mean I want you to read them out loud as I read them. These eight characteristic traits of true happiness, the eight Beatitudes. And so beginning there, Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 3, read along with me. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of, of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in, is great in heaven, for so persecuted the prophets who were before you. So as we learned last week, and uh, when Jesus kicked off this, this series of, of statements there uh, on what true happiness was, th these were really some... Um, shocking statements that Jesus made. And, and, and the first one there, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And, and so we learned last week that um, true happiness comes when we recognize that we are spiritually poor. This idea that, that we are completely dependent upon God in order to get to heaven. His next statement was equally as, as shocking though. Look there at, at what he said there in verse number four. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Man, this makes no sense at all, doesn't it? I mean, wait a minute. You know, you're like, Jesus, hang on a second. You mean to tell me in order for me to be happy, I have to be sad? You're telling me that, you know, if, if, if a loved one dies or if I lose my job or um, if my marriage falls apart or if I have a kid who goes astray, you're telling me that I'm going to find happiness in the tragedies of life. I mean, that, that makes no sense at all. And, 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 and how could there be any joy in that? And if you're a, not a believer and you've got questions about God, you've got questions about Jesus and all of these types of things, this, a statement like that is a statement that you know, proves to you that this Bible is dumb and it makes no sense at all. And, and, and honestly, um, you know, I, I can see where you could get that. But, but I want you to hang on for a second here, okay? Because just when Jesus said, blessed are the poor, he wasn't talking about us being physically poor, financially poor, or anything like that. When, when Jesus makes this statement here, he's, he's, he's talk, not talking about the tragedies of life. And he's not talking about us mourning the tragedies of life, okay? Um, uh, uh, and, and, and listen, I, I'm not going to lie to you here. I want to be honest with you. We don't really exactly know what Jesus was talking about when he made this statement, blessed are those who mourn. We really don't. But when you put scripture into context, I, I, I think that we can get a pretty good understanding of what Jesus means here. And other scholars have come to uh, uh, agree with this as, as well. So when you look at the verses that come before it and the verses that come after it, you, you find out here that, that Jesus, he's, he's referring to um, more religious and more of ethical issues than he is talking about mourning life's tragedies here. And, and, and so because of the context, I think it's more accurate to say that Jesus was talking about mourning over religious and moral instances. Basically, this is what I'm trying to say here. Jesus wants us to mourn over our sin not our situations. That's what he's talking about here. Barnes's notes on the Bible puts it this way. This is capable of two meanings. Either that those who are blessed who are afflicted with the loss of friends or possessions, or that they who mourn over sin are blessed. As Christ came to preach repentance to induce people to mourn over their sins and to forsake them, it is probable that he had the latter particularly in view. 
So, so listen, when, when somebody loses a loved one, this is not the verse to quote to them. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. In fact, if you're in that situation and somebody quotes that verse to you, listen, I hereby give you the right to smack them upside the head. All right? Do it in Jesus' name, of course. And uh, you should probably do it with love. Um, in fact, maybe you should just smile and nod and just move on. Uh, that might be a better thing to do than smacking somebody upside the head. But, but this is not the verse to quote in that time because that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about this idea of mourning over sin, over the sinful nature of mankind. You see, the other scriptures even talk about this idea of us mourning and weeping over sin. Let, let, let me share one with you right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Verses 9 and 10, it says, as it, is, as it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. You see here, Christ desires that we get so close to him and that we desire to, to please him so strongly that even the mere thought or the mention of sin would grieve our hearts. He, he's talking about here this, this idea of, of living a life of holiness. And as one writer, writer put it, we are most holy when we are most happy in God. Holiness is, is, is fundamentally, it's an affection issue, not a behavior issue. Understand that. You see, as, as we fall more in love with Jesus and, and our affection for him grows, then our behaviors will flow from our affections. And so holiness is more about an affection than it is a behavior. That's why Paul said there in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, that's why he said, for godly grief produces repentance. You see, the closer we get to God, the more we mourn over the thought of sin, the more we turn from sin, and the more happy we are as a result. Psalms chapter 16 and verse 11, a beautiful passage of scripture says this, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That is what holiness really is like. As much joy and as much pleasure as we can contain for as long as possible. And, and listen, because it's a pleasure that comes from God, it lasts forever. And it is absolutely true happiness. It is being in a state of supreme happiness. This is why Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. We find supreme happiness in holiness. To be holy is to see God as he really is and, 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 and to have a desire to become more like him. We, we have this desire to be covered in, in Christ's righteousness. And, and, and since God's nature is to be happy, the more we become like him, the more happier we become. You see how this is all fitting in now? Blessed are those who mourn. But, but listen, keep in mind, Holiness is not this state of denial. It's not characterized by abstaining from defiling thoughts or motivations and behaviors. True holiness is a state of delight. And the more true holiness we experience, the fuller our joy and the greater our pleasure. I read an article this week that uh, uh, the, the writer, he made this statement. It's a little bit of a lengthy quote, but, but listen to me. Uh, this is what he said. We are to be holy as he is holy. So to pursue holiness, we must pursue our greatest happiness. Who has delivered us from our bodies of indwelling sin-induced death? Jesus Christ. Our unholy sin disease has been given a cure in the cross. We no longer need to fixate on the diagnostic tool of the law. Now in pursuit of holiness, we aim primarily at our affections, not primarily at our behaviors. For behaviors are symptomatic of the state of our affections. What is a delight to us ceases to be a duty to us. So today I want to share with you just a few thoughts here about this, this mourning uh, and what it is to mourn. And then we'll shift gears and we'll talk about um, the, the, the result, what it is to be comforted, okay? So, so number one, I want you to see this. Our mourning should be motivating. 
Our mourning should be motivating. This is a desire to be happy. Uh, a happiness not based on the circumstances outside around us, but from the character inside of us. And this should motivate us to hate sin. This desire to be happy, this desire to want to be, this ought to motivate us to holiness. James chapter 4 and verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Hebrews chapter 11 speaks about the, the fleeting pleasures of sin. And the King James Version of the Bible puts it this way. It talks about the pleasures of sin for a season. Listen, sin can be fun for a time, but that is what it is. It is only fun for a time. It is only fun for a moment. And at some point, the joy of that sin, it ends. Just like we talked about last week. You, you can live a, a perfectly great life here on earth and, and have no, no need for God in your life, but, but there's more to this life than just this life. And so for sin, it can be fun for a time, but it's going to end at some point. But you see, the joy that comes from holiness that lasts forever. There's no end to that. You see, holiness doesn't mean abstaining from pleasure. Holiness means recognizing Jesus as the supreme source of pleasure. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, holiness is the royal road to happiness. The death of sin is the life of joy. So our mourning should be motivating for us. Number two, our mourning should be minimal. Listen, there's nobody that's perfect, right? We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall victim to sin at some point here. And we're going to fail at times. But listen, in those moments when we do fail, in those moments when we do commit sin, it should be minimal. You see, if we mess up, if we sin, the best thing that we can do is to own it, confess it, and then move on. That, that's just what we have to do. There, there's no need for us to wallow in our sin and our regret and our mistakes. That's not Christ's plan for us. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, he says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, when, when we confess our sins, Jesus doesn't hold a grudge. You know, that's not true with people, right? That's not true. We make mistakes. Oftentimes people will hold it against us. They, they hold this grudge on us. But Jesus doesn't do that. And in fact, in Psalm chapter 103 and verse 12, it says this, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. You ever thought about that for a minute? If, if, if you were to put your finger on a globe and you were to start moving your finger east, do you realize you will always be moving east? You'll, you'll never end up moving west. That's not true if you go north to south, right? If you go north, eventually you end up going south. And then you end up going north again. And it's a repetitive cycle of north and south. But east to west, it never meets. And so when Jesus says, I put my, your sin as far as the east is from the west, he literally means no more to be remembered. He's forgetting about it. And so, listen, when, when we uh, commit sin... We, we, we shouldn't just wallow in it. We, we, we should mourn over sin, but not be miserable in it. Find happiness in Christ's forgiveness. Number three, I want you to see this. Our mourning should be our mindset. Now I say this, even though it's a little bit repetitive to number one uh, there, I want you to understand that, that this is the mindset that we should have, is that we mourn over sin. That, that we don't just say, well, you know, God's going to forgive me and he's going to forget it so I can commit sin and just ask for forgiveness and move on and, and be okay. Listen, our mindset should be holiness. We should fall in love with Jesus every day so that we fall away from sin because our happiness and holiness is found in our affections, not our behaviors. Now, switching gears here. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. What is comfort anyways? You know, um, comfort is, is something that makes you feel good, right? 
uh, I, I'm a foodie, so for me, when I think about comfort, I think about comfort food, right? Uh, it makes me think of biscuits and gravy. It makes me think of fried chicken and waffles. It makes me think about mashed potatoes and macaroni and cheese. And my mama makes the best, by the way. And and, and it pretty much uh, any kind of fried food, right? That's comfort food. It, it makes you feel good when, when you get to eat that. And, and, and so when Jesus said that we should mourn over our sin, that we're going to be comforted, he's telling us here that we're going to feel good for our decisions to refrain from sin. That's what, that's what he's trying to tell us. And so let, let me share with you just a few things about comfort real quick. No, number one is this. Our comfort is confirmed. You notice in there it says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. This is a promise of God that he will comfort us. This is important for us to know because, listen, God never breaks a promise. In, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, in hope of eternal life, which God who never lies promised before the ages began. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 8, it says, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Listen, when we mourn over our sin, when we resist sin, when we forego the pleasures of sin, God has promised us it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. We will be comforted, and it's a good kind of comfort. Number two, our comfort is complete. In, in studying for this, this, this passage and this message this week, I, I found there's a lot of commentary. There's a lot of scholars who talk about blessed are those that mourn. And it talks about what this mourning is here. But um, to be honest, there wasn't a whole lot about the other side of it, about this, this comfort here. And so, you know, when I study this out, this is what I came to find out that means. It means you're going to feel better. Yeah. It's that simple. He, he's, he's saying, listen, when you mourn over sin, when you desire a life of holiness, God has promised to make you feel better. Listen, how do you find comfort when things go wrong in your life? Maybe even right now, how, how have you found comfort uh, in, the, in the quarantine, in, in all this craziness? You know, some people, they find comfort in ice cream. Right. You know, when that relationship uh, ends or, you know, you get stood up on that date, you know, you turn to your friends, Ben and Jerry, and you sit on the couch and, and, and you eat ice cream to make yourself feel better, to get that comfort. Some people find comfort in shopping. We like to buy something new to help us to feel better, some new shoes or, or some new clothes or something. Some of us resort to exercise to find comfort. And, and, and when life gets stressful, we, we throw on the running shoes and we go for a run or we pick up the weights and, uh, and we sweat out the stress and we find comfort in exercise. Some of us do all of the above and sometimes we do all of the above at the same time. That's okay. No judging here. But here's what I found out though. Although all of those things can, can bring us comfort, um, when those things are over, when you get to the bottom of that pint of ice cream and when, it, when that run is finished and that workout session is over, oftentimes what I have found out is that, that that hurt is still there. But that's not the comfort that Christ is promising us here. Christ is promising us, promising us a comfort that is complete. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. In verse number 5 of that same chapter, he says, For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. You see, the Bible describes this as a peace that surpasses all understanding. In Philippians chapter number four and verse number seven, it says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Many scholars believe that, that Jesus, when he made the statement, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, they believe that he was referring to the prophet Isaiah. And what Isaiah said in, in Isaiah chapter number 61, verses one to three, look at what it says. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, 
to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness. You see, here's the thing. The comfort that Christ gives us is complete because of number three, our comfort is continual. It's continual. Listen, when Jesus left this earth, he promised to send us another helper. The the King James Version of the Bible refers to this as the comforter. No matter how you read it, it's the Holy Spirit that, that Jesus was talking about here. The Holy Spirit is our helper and our comforter. Look in Scripture, John chapter 14, verse 26. It says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. John chapter 16, and verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And listen, the Holy Spirit is continually present in our lives. He's always there. Why? Because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. The Holy Spirit is inside of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? Psalm chapter 139 and verse 7, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? Listen, There is not a person anywhere who can be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. There's not a person who can follow Christ without the help of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sees everything that goes on. He knows what goes on in our hearts, and He knows what goes on in our minds. Nothing is hidden from the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14, the the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is eternal, therefore that we can know that our comfort is continual. It's always, always there. Our comfort is continual. As I wrap things up here, I want to ask you a question to reflect on. When is the last time that you wept over sin? When is the last time that you looked your sin in the mirror and you came away broken about it? When was the last time that you felt the gravity of your sin and your betrayal against a holy God? Here's the very unsettling truth. Our hearts have become callously numb. Though we're justified by the blood of Christ and, and, and our, lives, uh, our lives are still infiltrated with sin, and, and, and most of the time, we're okay with it. The book of James was written to encourage believers back to to faithful living instead of um, a life of sinful wandering. And and, and at the height of of his letter, James, he he makes this appeal for believers to see their sin rightly as, as, as for what it is and for us to act accordingly because of that. Look at what he says. James chapter four, verses eight and nine. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. You see, James wants his readers to feel the weight and the ugliness of their sin and to mourn over it. But why, as believers, should we? Why should we weep over sin? Listen, James writes this way because he knows that the gospel becomes glorious when the depth and power of our sin is understood as grievous. When we see a clear glimpse of our sin, we behold a clear glimpse of Christ's sacrifice. Basically, what I'm saying is this. The horror of our sin magnifies the beauty of Christ's sacrifice. The reality is that the gospel is good news of great joy because it invades dreadful news of great sorrow. And, and, and steps in and changes, uh, it steps in and it changes things, bringing us to God as his own. And here's the thing. The result is that God gets the glory and we receive the joy. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. God, we love you. God, we thank you. And God, my prayer today is simply this, that we will learn to mourn and weep over our sins. God, given us a desire and a passion to live a life of holiness, not just behavior, 
But God, out of an affection for you, out of a love for you, may we strive to live a holy life for you. And God, it's in your wonderful name that we do pray. Amen. Well, hey, I just want to thank you for tuning in to Exponential Church Online today and watching that message. And uh, man, I don't know about you, but to me, it is um, just quite an incredible feeling to know that we have a comforter, the, the Holy Spirit, who is with us continually. And uh, it doesn't matter where we go through in life or what we're dealing with. And again, with the ups and downs of life, it's good to know that there's a constant um, in our lives. And that constant is the comforter, the Holy Spirit uh, working in us. Right. Um, I know, too, there's those times where I just, I struggle. I struggle with messing up or, or sinning and I, I get frustrated, but it's, it's okay because we need to take that time to mourn over it. We need to ask God to, to forgive us for that sin. But yet, like you said, we have the Holy Spirit that in that time of mourning over maybe the time we messed up or what we're doing, the Holy Spirit, Spirit is there comforting us and letting us know, you know, I still love you, I'm still here, I forgive you, and let's move on. And that's so right. comforting to me. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I mentioned in the message, you know, that uh, our mourning should be minimal. Mm -hmm. You know, we, um, we, we mourn, we, we regret the fact that we, right. we committed sin and that we, you know, dis disobeyed God or betrayed God. But, um, but man, we confess it, we move on. Mm -hmm. um, God doesn't want us to wallow. Uh, in our sin and, and our regret and things. He wants us to move on to better ourselves, uh, to become uh, more like Him and to draw closer to Him. And um, that's why that, that whole idea of, you know, holiness, it's, holiness is not a behavior, it's, it's an affection. And, and the more that we fall in love with Jesus, then our behavior just naturally becomes holy, becomes righteous because we, we want to shun sin because we love Jesus so much and so uh definitely a great thought there and uh hey listen uh again we thank you for tuning in with us here at exponential online and uh, a couple ways that that you can get involved uh with exponential church online uh first off we we talk about this a lot and, and sometimes it's awkward but uh hey we want you to get involved with giving uh, to Exponential Church financially and uh, being a part of the mission of the church. And, and we're able to do a lot of things, even during quarantine, we're able to do things and help feed families and such. And so uh, we want to invite you to get involved with that. we got a couple different ways you can do that. You can text the amount to the number 84321, or you can go to our website, expochurch.com, and then click on the Give tab there, and you can get that set up. Uh, you can do a one-time donation, or you can get it set up to uh, do um, continuous giving. You can set up weekly, bi-weekly, whatever you want to do in that. And so uh, a couple different ways for you to get involved with Exponential Church and, and partnering with us as we strive to reach people in Port St. Lucie for the cause of Christ. And so uh, there's also a couple other ways that you can get involved. Man, if you love uh, to say smash that like button. Yes, yeah, smash the like button. Yep, go ahead and tell them. Yep, smash that like button, forward it to all your friends, talk about what the great services we had, and um, especially next week is Mother's Day. Yep. And we got an exciting service next week where I'll be joining Pastor Steve and talking about um, the meek shall inherit the earth. And so um, just a thought from that, just meekness is not weakness. So just right. think about this that this week. Yep, great thought for people to get mm -hmm. ready for next week. And uh, don't forget about Mother's Day. Make sure you reach out and contact your mamas and um, and let them know that you love them. Invite them to watch Expo with you uh, online next week. And and we are, Amanda's gonna join me in the message. We talk about uh, this, uh, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And, um, and Amanda already hitting you with the truth bomb. Uh, that meekness is not a weakness. And so uh, we pray that you'll uh, get ready for us next week can join us at Exponential Church Online. And how about the band today? Oh, it was uh, wonderful. Wasn't that exciting? Oh my goodness, yes. It's good to see them and, and to hear them uh, singing with us again. And so just a great service today. Right. Uh, excited about what God has in store for us. All right, Expo, we love you. We care about you. And again, uh, we, say that, we say this every week. We don't just say it. We, we truly mean it. If you have a need, uh, please reach out to us, let us know, and uh, we'd love to be able to, to, to help you out any way that we possibly can. If it's just a thing you don't feel like getting out of the house, and, uh, but you need some groceries, hey, give us a call. We'll uh, go and pick up groceries for you and get them to your house and, and, and do whatever we can to be a blessing to you, okay? Uh, we love you. We thank you for joining with us here at Exponential Church Online, and we can't wait to see you next week.